to get at the content of the lessons, which is not easy to bear, we need to start with Collect. Because it sets the frame for, I think, actually, how we're meant to hear. O God, whose glory is always to have mercy. Whew, glad that's true. <laughs> Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways. And the colic means us. In other words, the colic acknowledges from the front end both the mercy of God and our need for God's mercy because we acknowledge the fact that we are not just have gone, but are going astray from the ways of God. And notice the prayer, bring them again. In other words, it's not, hey you, get over here. It's instead God's action to literally come and take us close, not just outwardly, but literally with a change of heart. Penitent is the word that is used. You see, the understanding is, is that if I, as a believer in Jesus, and some are out there, more often than not, I have found some way to justify my position. I've found some way to be at peace in some fashion or another, including lying to myself if it comes to it, that somehow to be there is still somehow okay enough for me to continue in that place where I have strayed. Otherwise, I'd be in hell inside and be doing whatever I can, even to claw my way back into a place of grace if I felt like I needed it. So if I'm out there, if I'm astray, it's because I've created the path inside to be able to get there with some level of personal justification without straying from the text too much. This is really the story of Adam and Eve eating of the fruit. Remember the, the line? At, it shows Adam's way to get there. He looked at it. He saw that it was good for food, that it was appealing to the eye, and therefore he ate. In other words, he didn't just say, what a great idea, sir. He had to go through some path in his brain that actually justified his reason for getting there. So it is with us. If we're in a place where we are astray, we are astray it's because we've worked out some kind of inner justification for being able to get there. Or if not, if temptation literally drug us away, which can happen at times, we still find a way for staying there to justify why that's an okay place to be. Are you with me? Does this feel familiar, brothers and sisters? So in other words, we're not just asking God to come and to bring us, but literally the cre created us a change of heart. Bring them, again, with penitent hearts and steadfast faith that somehow this is better. See? A part of the very nature of faith is, is that it says, God's ways are better. And therefore, even though there are in me ferocious desires to stay in the place of being astray, it is in fact by the very mercy of God that I acknowledge <coughs> at some level in my being that I am not entirely deceived. Because staying there is actually right where you go. You go so deceived that you finally feel so, in, and feel so entirely justified that I can be Christian and still be there, that I, it will confirm in me, in fact, the rightness of my decision. That's really the end of self-deception, is that I convince myself that sin, in some capacity, is actually me to end right so to do. As a Christian. And so I need God to break in, carry me back, change my heart, and release in me the faith to say that the price of getting from here to there, though paid by Jesus, is not an easy road for me, but it is worth it. Are you with me? 
It is from that perspective we have to look at the parable that Jesus tells of the rich man and Lazarus because the conclusions are unequivocal. They are unequivocal. <clears throat> The story is pretty familiar if you've grown up in church. Lazarus, which literally is a derivation of Eleazar, which means God helps. You already know, in other words, when you hear the name, what, where this is going. By the gate, abject poverty, physical infirmity to the point that he cannot even move because he can't even protect himself from the unclean dogs that come and lick his wounds. Dog lover I am, this is not a sign of God's comfort to send dogs <laughs> to come and lick your wounds. They are actually unclean animals that spread infection and therefore render you both physically worse and unclean before the law. This is not a good thing. So judgment comes, it's the big reversal. We just know the rich man as the rich man. No name attached to him. But where does he end up? He ends up in Hades. Why does he end up in Hades? Because of an entirely self-centered approach to life that really is symbolized by what's going on in his inability to even acknowledge that he had an obligation to help Lazarus. Whom he knows. It's not as if somehow he was obliviously unaware of this poor, decrepit man crippled at his gate, and literally the Greek is this very large gate. It's a mansion. It's a pylon, to use the Greek word. It's a big deal. He knows him. He just doesn't feel like he has any reason to stop and to help and assist the man, which is why he can call him by name. When he sees him, though the gulf be there in this story, he sees Abraham. He sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, Full of comfort, he, by contrast, is in a place of torment. And, of course, the ironic piercing piece at the end. No, even if someone comes back from the dead, they, they will not be convinced. In other words, the lesson is, and the whole thrust of the way Jesus tells the story is that even though it is seeped in Jewish imagery, it is in fact a cogent command still in play for Christians. In other words, this is not I'm just sort of saved by faith and therefore it doesn't matter what I do with my money. Are you there? <laughs> in other words, this is in play. In other words, if Jesus is in fact at work in my life, a part of the evidence of that is that I will be giving away what I have. And if that's not present, then somehow we're there and we need to be brought here. In other words, I need Jesus to break <coughs> through and show me somehow that to be out there in the spending on myself is in fact ungodly and that I need to be brought back so that I agree with the unchangeable truth, this is the end of the collect of God's word, Jesus Christ, who is telling me presently through the Bible, you can't be there unless you really want to end up like the rich man. Hello. I can think of all kinds of reasons, all kinds of reasons, as to why that parable does not apply to me. And they're good ones. Theologically well thought out. There's nuance in them. But there's this terrible line in the book of Proverbs that says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction and death. Or to put it in the New Living Translation, you can think whatever you want, but is God convinced? <laughs> All of that applies to this story. This story that Jesus wanted included in the Gospel of Luke, here by understanding of inspiration. For the sake of his body, the church, that we as a people might be known as a people that cares profoundly 
for the Lazaruses of this world and does so not just in sentiment, <coughs> but they show up. <coughs> they show up. And they are known to the world as a people who care for the least and for the lost. And that is a part of our witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because at the resurrection, believe me, I don't want to be out there. Amen. Amen. Amen.